Welcome to Art House Radio. I'm Troy. Uh, this week, the guests are Chris and Santos. And every week that I have a guest, we each pick a movie, throw it into a hat, and then we draw it live on Instagram at arthouse.radio. And if you join live, you can pick one too, and it goes straight into the hat as well. This week's movie is The Fountain by Aaron Aronofsky. I think that's saying that right. Uh, starring Rachel Weiss. Oh, it's Weiss or Weiss. Ellen Burstyn and Hugh Jackman. Let's talk about it. So I just watched, again, The Fountain. Um, I haven't seen it for probably six or seven years. This was actually my pick I threw into the hat. Um, and I didn't know what to expect after seeing it, not seeing it for so long. Um, and I know straight off the bat, it's not a movie for most people. I think uh, it's, it's, it's not a Marvel movie. It's not something for the masses. Um, and it can be confusing to kind of follow, but man, something about it just affects me. Uh, it has a lot of different stories going on, layered on top of each other, different versions of characters going through different times. And I think ultimately it's just about, um, you know, coping with the reality of death and life and what we can control and what we can't and learning the hard lesson of at some point you got to let it go and you got to accept it. Um, there's the scientist played by Hugh Jackman who was coming close to a cure and he was just going mad by, by trying to save his wife and I get it. But then he learned kind of, I think the lesson in the long end that you can't cheat death. And, <clears throat> you know, he even said it, he's like, we're, Death is a disease, and that means there's a cure, and I'm going to find it. And uh, and from that point on, 20 minutes left, the last 20 minutes just blows my mind. Uh, because it just takes it up a notch. The music is fantastic. It's very operatic. To me, it's an opera in a lot of respects. Um, and... Uh, uh, you know, I think anybody who's struggling with, you know, this type of scenario in their lives, probably this may help them, it may push them over the edge, but it may also help them. I don't know. But um, it, it just, I think it defines a lot. It says a lot. And I think um, Darren Aronofsky, Aronofsky um, his movies are just crazy in general, but, uh, but they're all really good. They just have a, a very deep, powerful and empowering message usually um with a lot of crazy mixed in of course and i don't think this is any different um yeah and it's just kind of a it's just kind of a deep topic so it's not for everybody but i really liked it um and uh kudos to to you jackman i, I think you did a fantastic job if you ever get a chance watch the behind the scenes because his acting behind the scenes they do a lot of like back end filming of, of his acting and, and him practicing his parts. It's incredible. It's incredible. So I, I suggest that as well. So there were just a few more uh, points I wanted to make about the fountain. Um, the visual cues and the symmetry and the symbology throughout the whole movie was so consistent and so um, mesmerizing to me. So when, for instance, um, you know, the lighting in the, in the lab is always very dark and the hospital is very dark. And then you had it focused more on the lights that were shining through and they were very consistent and patterned and they matched a lot. Like when, um, and this was amazing how Aaron Aronofsky did this, but I don't think anybody else has done this before. Um, but when a car would drive by in one scene or they were riding a horse in one scene, the camera would be upside down. And then there would be a string of lights, like a runway that matched the lighting in the, in the labs and all that kind of stuff. And then as the car or horse was driving by, the camera would flip up on its side and you'd be still looking at it uh, going forward, but upside down as well. And that was just amazing to me. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever done that, that kind of camera angle before. Um, and then queuing up the lighting 
with the with the music, especially at the end as they're in this tree of life bubble going into the Shambhala, you know, star, nebula, whatever it is. Um, it's just super mesmerizing. So all of that synced together was just fantastic, I thought. I thought this movie was, uh, The Fountain was definitely worth a watch. Uh, I would describe it as jarring. Um, I think it did a really effective job of just provoking different emotions. Like there's a scene when uh, Izzy's in the bathtub and she ends up pulling, I'm just going to call him Wolverine, into the tub. I don't even know how, I can't even explain it again because it's like so many weird things happen. Like me explaining it doesn't really do it justice because it's about the, the weird camera angles. Uh, just the the weird mixture of emo. It's the mixture of emotions that it sort of evokes at the same time because like it's a really sad scene because you're kind of finding out as a viewer that there really is something wrong with her. Like medically uh she's going through something she's in the bath so it's like sad but then they start like like it's a turns into like a love making scene and he gets pulled into the bath like fully clothed there's just a lot going on um so it's a very jarring film and uh like brian described it as being about in the end it's about dealing with death and with loss um there were a bunch of things about this film that I don't know. All I can do is describe them. I don't I don't know how I feel about them, if they're positive or negative, just that they're there and that they're different and that these characteristics are uh, strong in the sense of being just having a lot of uh, emotion to them. Uh, so, for example, there's not very many characters in this in this film at all. There's not really a world outside of this small set of characters and there's no character development really i guess you could say with with either of the two main characters there could be but there's really no other significant characters there's a handful of scientists who who play a role in doctors um and that's really it and like half of the movie not a half of it but a significant portion is just like Wolverine eating mushrooms and tripping balls like that's and just these weird trippy uh sort of imagery up on the screen so it's it's a different film it's it uh Brian talked a little bit about the lighting it's very dark and like half of the movie almost takes place in the lab and it's it's very dark it's almost hard to see right so there's all of these different elements that just give it this kind of isolating feel even though it's touching on both extremes, like complete feeling of like isolation and uh, loss of attachment and devastation, but also being connected to something much bigger and just sort of giving into that feeling of like transition and moving on. So for me, there were two things that I thought about immediately finishing the movie and probably watching it throughout. One, I think the topic is super interesting. I don't know that it's new because it's sort of dealing with, you know, he talked about death being a disease, as Brian mentioned. Um, and he was going to find the cure. That sounds to me like a lot like the Black Mirror episode where the woman's husband dies and she orders a robot who looks just like him and is language is based around the text messages or whatever it is um i mean that's it's it's maybe the means are different but the end result is kind of the same i mean he, hugh jackman's character tommy tommy boy is trying to stop death from happening in the first place which is a big difference but they're both dealing with kind of the same thing in that they're playing god in a way so to speak and whatever God means to you. I don't mean like a uh, guy in sandals in the rain cloud looking down on you. I just mean, you know, being able to control uh, mortality, consciousness, things like that. To prevent you from dying or resurrect you from dying. I get that they're different things, but 
they're touching on the same thing, like Frankenstein, I believe. Frankenstein was a monster. Dr. Frankenstein assembled what is labeled as a monster in the book, I think. It's been a long time. One of my favorite books, but it's been a while. Um, from old body parts and mysterious chemicals. So it's kind of the same thing. It's kind of... Uh, puts you in this interesting question about whether you should be meddling with something or whether we should accept uh, a mortality in a way. And, you know, I mean, it raises a lot of interesting questions about whether, you know, what, what are, what's the end game here with science? Like science, as the three of us have kind of talked about before, views itself as knowledge itself in a way. Like you have to go through science, even though our science doesn't really know that much. I mean, we know a lot, but you know, we don't. Ask Neil deGrasse Tyson about dark matter and dark energy, and that makes up 95% of the universe or something, and we don't know what either of those is. So that to me is not knowing very much. So that's one thing I was thinking about. The other, thing I'm thinking about is that for me it just didn't execute it very well like I, there were moments where I felt like the music and Rachel Weiss or Weiss and Jackman like their acting was really good there was a particular moment I can't remember where maybe around 35 minutes left where they they're such good actors that I almost got pulled in and I did for a moment there but what for me what kills it is the CGI the the golden strands coming out of his chest and he's doing the um, s crouching downward pose, you know, in the middle of some sort of multi-dimension, interdimension reality or something. I don't, to me, I just, this is just a personal preference. I, I would rather just hear someone talk about it or some somebody sitting in the grass having a good dialogue or with, even if it's with themselves. I don't need to see, you know, golden strands shooting out of your bald head and talking about, uh, implying, not talking about, but implying some sort of magical, because you're not really going to capture that magical force if it exists anyway. And to me, it just kind of takes me out of it like, oh boy, you know, it, so I don't, I, it's probably happened a lot of times in movies. For me, it was a swing and a miss, but I like the topic. Not to shit on this movie because I think that I, I don't think it was bad. I, don't, I also don't think it was great, but I feel like I would have been blown away by this movie if I was like 19 and I had just smoked a joint. Uh, it would have just blown my mind. Um, it, it is a little bit older to 2006, is it? Uh, so, you know, if it feels like the overall theme has kind of been done before, I think, you know. At least this film came out a while ago now, 15 years ago or so. Um, so before some of these other uh, TV series or movies that maybe touch on the same topic. Um, I felt like it did have some kind of critique. Maybe critique is too strong of a word. It had something to suggest about science and colonialism or sort of comparing the two because uh, she calls Tommy her her conqueror, always trying to, to uh, or her conquistador, always trying to conquer everything when he's trying to, you know, come up with his breakthrough to try and stop death, essentially. So it's got some kind of maybe critique in there, um, but it doesn't really, it doesn't really get too specific other than, um, I mean, the last 20 minutes... Brian, uh, it sounded like Brian was uh, really enthralled by that. I almost felt like the last 20 minutes of the film didn't need to happen because the sort of real story app, uh, wraps up before then. And then the last 20 minutes is just like crazy shit. Like he's eating a tree and then flowers are like growing out of his mouth. It almost gets campy at the end. And I'm not really sure that it means to. Um, so I, I kind of agree about, with Troy about some of the imagery that I just didn't need it. Like, it, it almost took away from the film. And I almost felt the same about the whole Mayan uh, conquistador 
historical element to it too. Like I didn't really, that kind of distracted me a little bit. I, I felt like it could have been, they could have just used that time to develop the, the sort of real story of what was going on between Tommy and Izzy. Um, because they didn't really have any other characters. They could have just been used for other stuff. Uh, I, I felt like it detracted a little bit for me from the experience. Yeah, the conquistador thing was interesting. I forgot to mention that. Um, they could have gone that direction too. So I did sense that there was this sort of, you know, Western modern idea of medicine, how we think of it as ibuprofen and whatever else. And then you have like shamans who have been doing things probably for thousands of years. And, you know, neither one of, maybe neither one of us is, no civilization maybe has ever gotten, has pulled itself close to the secrets. Um, but maybe we end up getting to the same level. Maybe now, I don't know, maybe, I mean, you'd think that now things are better with like vaccinations and things like that. But they're also, if there were less people on the planet back then, they wouldn't have needed to have vaccinations i mean they clearly needed them when the um western the colonizers arrived because i mean what did that night i, I don't want to get my facts wrong here but i just heard on a podcast it was like 90 percent of native american they think i don't know if they know it's maybe like 60 million people who lived here and i'm just talking out of my ass but um clearly the the smallpox or whatever it was the plague um devastated um, diseases uh, devastated North American countries but other than that like how often were they coming in contact so maybe they they didn't develop medicine to the level that we might have it but they didn't need it also so um, but anyway yeah they I thought there were a few things they could have explored like that and you know sometimes movies change um, for me like you know I might watch it today and go yeah it's okay and give it a five out of ten or something but then you watch it 10 years from now and you think, well, wow, that's much better than I had realized on the first viewing. So yeah, I think uh, it's a good movie for thinking about those things and it's gotta be difficult to make a movie. You know, so many places where your vision can sort of get off track, like you, sh you shoot it and maybe the actors aren't quite on or the actors are on and the, the takes are hot but then in the editing room it kind of falls apart or the music kind of undercuts it or something you know so there's it's pot you know i don't know it would be interesting to hear what they have to say the uh, director but you'd never really know i don't think they they probably unless they're very brutally honest which i respect i don't think they're probably going on to um discussions with people in-depth discussions where they may yeah it's, this was i wish i had done this or i wish i had done that or i see something that nobody else sees and if nobody catches it in my lifetime fine but maybe they'll catch it down the road always possible so there's um one thing i was going to mention earlier and i'm just reacting to both of your last reactions um i was going to bring this up anyway but um, so the the movie The Fountainhead, um, a long drawn out history back and forth of, of the studio approving it to go forward and money issues and all that kind of stuff. So by the time they actually got around to finally doing it, they didn't have a lot of money. So most of the um, the, the the color scheme and the, and the graphics and all that stuff, there's very little CGI. So that at the end, for instance, with all the nebula stuff and the orange clouds and all everything around them, except for probably the stuff shooting out of his chest, like Troy was mentioning, but pretty much all that chemical reaction was actually done. Um, they, they, they had a chemist um, create some chemical reactions in a Petri dish and they shot off of that. And that's kind of what came out of it all these chemical reactions from the Petri dish. I thought that was a really interesting fact. Um, and I thought it turned out really well. Um, so just to kind of plug that in there. And then uh, the whole conquistador thing. So I just remember growing up hearing about 
the fountain of youth all the time. Uh, we were taught that in, in school and all that. And I think it was Ponce de Leon that, that found the fountain of youth somewhere like in Florida or whatever stuff, or it was just, you know, nobody really knows. And it's not, probably doesn't even really exist, but um, I think uh, this was a different take on it that I thought was interesting. And uh, I think over the last couple of decades, they've been finding a lot of um, uncover, or cover, uncovering a lot of lost temples or cities underneath like rainforests and stuff in the um, um, like Guatemalan area where a lot of Mayans are. So I think that's probably the take that they, they were taking from it is that this is a lost city where the Fountain of Youth is, where there's a lot of still questions and stuff being discovered and it was, seemed like ripe to kind of plug it into the Mayan culture maybe. Um, I thought that, all that was interesting. Again, the last 20 minutes I thought was really impactful with the music with the, the chemical reactions happening around this, this nebula, I thought was interesting, but it's not for everyone I know. So there you go. Well, there you go. There's the fountain reviewed on Art House Radio with Chris and Santos as guests. You can catch us everywhere at arthouse.radio on Instagram and patreon.com slash arthouseradio. And subscribe to this if you can. It helps a lot. All right.